Now, we've been in a series over the last few weeks called Who Are We? Who are we as the church? And we've seen that Jesus is our good shepherd. And we've talked about what's called the shepherd's metaphor. All through the Bible, through most every book of the Bible, there might be a few exceptions, but for most of the books in the Bible, you're going to be introduced to the concept of shepherding and sheep. And the Bible likens God himself to a shepherd who takes care of his people, who leads his people, who provides for his people, who protects for his people. And we see this all through the Bible, in various stages of the Bible, we see God as a shepherd, a good shepherd who loves his people and provides for them. And we've seen that Jesus is the good shepherd. We've seen, we looked at the 23rd Psalm last week and we kind of showed the overarching story of the good shepherd and the, and the shepherd's metaphor in the Psalm 23 that is one of the most famous verses of the Bible. And we saw that God wants to protect, he wants to provide, and he wants to guide us. This morning, we're going to go into Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 is a prophetical book, and it's a scripture that is a prophecy that's given by a prophet named Ezekiel who lived sometime around 600 B.C. Now, the context of this chapter is that Ezekiel is a prophet, and the nation of Israel has gone wayward. In fact, they've been living in sin, and, and the nation is about to be punished for their sin by what's called the Babylonian captivity. God's people were so wayward that God had to allow them to be captured as a disciplinary action to, action to kind of get the nation righted again and get the nation going where God wanted it to go. And so out of love, God allowed the nation to be disciplined. And so God raised up several prophets to declare what he was doing. And one of those prophets that he raised up was a man named Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest. He was living in Babylon. And he got various prophecies to let God's people know what God was doing and what God was going to do, not only in the moment and what they were struggling with, but what God was going to bring out of. What God reveals to Ezekiel is that the problems that they were going with through currently would have a, 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 an effect upon the nation to prepare them for blessing in the future. And so in the midst of declaring a judgmental word, he also gives them the promise of hope and fulfillment. Now here's the thing that we need to remember. Is that as we read Ezekiel 34, the only way for us really to understand the message that God is giving Ezekiel is for us to understand the shepherd's metaphor. Because the context of the big picture context of this scripture, like a lot of scriptures, is the idea that God is Israel's shepherd, that he protects, provides, and guides for her, his flock. And that God raises up under shepherds, leaders. Now, in the Old Testament, those leaders were prophets and priests and kings. And he anointed those leaders to lead the nation. And they were likened to shepherds, really under shepherds. God being the true shepherd and them being the under shepherds to lead God's people on the earth. Now, Ezekiel is going to be given a message of judgment as well as hope that we're going to read in this chapter. But what I want us to see is like sometimes... The best way to learn is from a contrast. Like, like if you want to teach somebody a lesson, like if you're going to teach somebody, for instance, how to golf, sometimes the best way to teach somebody is to show them a bad example. So they get me up here and say, now, watch Pastor Bob swing his golf club. Don't do that. <laughs> See, that's sometimes we get a negative example can actually impact us and we can say, I, I don't want to do it like that. And some of us have had, and you know, we celebrate Father's Day today. Some of us have had great fathers. Some of us have had not so great fathers. And so when we've gone through various experiences, whether we've had great fathers or not so great fathers, we say to ourselves, I don't want to do it that way. And we can learn even from a bad example. Now, so the Bible is filled with these contrasts, and that's one of the things that we see here in Ezekiel 34, that, that really there's an example, even though some of these texts are a little bit tough to read, there is a positive message here. And the positive message is this. I want to share with you this morning, based on this text, even though, truthfully, guys, I could write a book. If I had the time, I could write a book, a whole book on this one chapter. This book is rich. This book is thick with a lot of spiritual and practical information that I can't give you today. And I could spend several hours preaching various aspects of this this morning, but that's not what I'm going to do. What I want to stay focused on, I want to take this shepherd's metaphor that we've been looking at. I want to look at our identity as God's sheep, as his flock, that we are individuals, but we're all collective as a flock. And I want to bring out three positive benefits that we get from being in community. 
You see, one of the challenges we have, one of the things I want to address over this summer is I'm trying to address both the individuality of us as Christians and followers of Christ, but also the communal aspect of who we are. We don't want to minimize or, or negate our individuality because community, like marriage, is not a loss of individuality. Community is a bringing together a group of individuals. But it is very possible to bring a group of individuals together and have a crowd, but that does not necessarily mean they're a church. You see, when God begins to move in a people, he brings a group of people together called a crowd. People begin to come. People begin to gather. And then God begins to work in that people to make them a community or a flock. And then as a group of individuals and as a group as a whole, they begin to receive an identity and an anointing and a future and a destiny that God has for them as a people. And I would submit to you this morning that that's what God is doing at Eagle's Nest. Is God has taken individuals and brought them together. And we've gone through different experiences and processes. And God is working in the midst of those. And now he's in the, in the, in the process of making us a people in order to bring us into a destiny that he has for us both individually and collectively as a people. Now, in a community, we're going to see, based on what Ezekiel says and the shepherd metaphor says, instead of just, we're going to look at the application of the scripture, not so much the interpretation. You see, there's three levels. Let me give you a real simple Bible study that I follow all the time. When you want to study the Bible and get the most out of it, you want to look for three things. Number one, what does it say? You read the text, you say, what does it say? Get familiar with what it says. Then you interpret it. You say, what does it mean? What did it mean to the people that were hearing it for the first time? What did it mean to the persons who were speaking it and writing it? What did it mean to God when he originally gave this message? And then how do you apply is the third thing. How does this apply to my life? Sometimes people confuse application and interpretation, making them the same thing. They are not. This morning, what I'm going to do is apply this text, giving you a little bit of interpretation in the context of the day of Ezekiel, but really highlighting three things that this text illustrates for us that God wants to provide for his people in the context of community. When we begin to become a people, and we're becoming a people with an identity and an, and an anointing and a calling and a destiny... God begins to do these three things at a higher level. The first is found in chapter 34 of Ezekiel, verses 1 through 16. Now, I'm not going to read all these verses for time's sake. But the first thing that God wants to provide for his people in community is care. God wants his people to be cared for. And we know that by what we read here because God is going to use a negative example of the shepherds of Israel who failed to do their job, failed to care for the people, God's going to get ticked at them and basically say, you're fired. You didn't do the job, so I'm going to do it myself. That's what he says in verses 1 through 16. Read with me in the text, Ezekiel 34. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel, feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. Now, now he goes into, so what he's saying is God is saying to these shepherds, the prophets, the priests, and kings of Israel in 590, 600 B.C., the na they've led the nation into destruction. They've led it away from God. God's saying, dude, you haven't done your job. I'm going to remove you, and then I want you to know why. He says in verse 4, the weak you have not strengthened. In other words, on a positive note, God is saying that one of the things that God wants provided in the community of the church through pastoral care, through the leadership of shepherds and the leadership of the church, and through the body coming together is he wants the weak to be strengthened. He wants the weak to be strengthened. He wants us to be ministered to and cared for. You know, we all go through seasons in our lives where we're weak. I'm here to tell you, nobody spirits. There's times I've gone through spiritual weak times. I've been weak. I've needed, like, pursued help. I've pursued care. Because the li life just gets too heavy. Things get too burdensome. We get tired. We get weary. 
And so one of the things that God wants to happen when we gather together and we're weary, you know, I was praying this morning as we were worshiping, and I was praying, Lord, I pray that as the heat of outside of our building, as the heat in our culture, as life gets heavy, as things get difficult, I pray for our church to become like a cool mountain stream and a pond, where an oasis in the desert where people can get a fresh drink of water. That's what God wants to provide in the context of community. That as we come together, we can be refreshed and strengthened. He says, nor have you healed those who were sick. So the implication there is that God wants us to be healed. He wants our spiritual, physical, emotional, financial, relational diseases to be healed. And we'll see in just a moment that that's very important to God in this text. He says, nor bound up the broken. Part of the role as a shepherd we saw when we looked at the 23rd Psalm and we looked at the shepherd's metaphor last week in Psalm 23. We saw that one of the roles of the shepherd is to come along and anoint the head with oil and bind up the wound to heal. See, we ought to be a hospital where people come in and begin to get rest and begin to get health and begin to be ministered to. That's what God wants to do in our midst. He says, nor brought back what was driven away. Sometimes people get driven away from the church. Folks, as we look at in just a moment flock dynamics, I want you to know that sometimes we hurt one another. And when that happens, God has ordained leadership and shepherding care and pastoral care to, to reconcile and to help heal those wounds and bring back those that are driven away, folks. That's what community is supposed to be about, bringing people back. He said, nor sought those that were lost, but with force and cruelty you ruled them. What God is saying to the shepherds is, guys, instead of caring for the flock, you've taken advantage of the flock, and therefore I'm going to act on their behalf. But here's what I want us to hear this morning. We can expect, we should expect to have an environment of care in our community, that the Spirit of God, and I'm convinced that there are things that God will do in your life in community that he will not do for you individually. You know, as I've grown in my own walk with God and as I've grown as a leader, more and more and more as I've grown, I have seen the need for community for not only yours but my and all of our individual callings to become a reality. We are going to have to be in community. We need each other. There's something that God chooses to do, as we'll see at the end of this chapter, in community that he will not do for us individually. You have an individual anointing if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus will give you his Holy Spirit, and he will anoint you to do certain things. But I'm here to tell you that that anointing will not find its fullest expression until we unite it with other people of like precious faith. When we come together, it creates a river that's much greater than our individual streams. And one of those things that happens is God cares for his people in community. And so God tells them what happened to the flock because the leaders failed to do their job in creating. See, I said last week when we looked at the 23rd Psalm that one of the things that a shepherd does is to create in a community and in an environment where the sheep can ruminate, where the sheep can eat and begin to create health to where the sheep can actually be sheep and really do their thing. And that's created by leadership. Well, these leaders failed to do that. And so he says they were scattered because there was no shepherd. See, the sheep without a shepherd are scattered. In fact, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, when Jesus Christ was, was ministering to the multitudes, the Bible says that he looked out and he said, pray. He said to his disciples, pray for laborers. He said, the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. And he said, before he said that, he said these words. He looked out and had compassion upon the multitude because they were sheep like sheep without a shepherd. And what we've been seeing in this shepherd's metaphor is that sheep without a shepherd are victims. Sheep without a shepherd don't have their needs met. Sheep without a shepherd become prey. This is what he says. He says, my sheep, in verse 6, or verse 5, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the high mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, 
and no one was seeking them. What God is saying, you see, what one of the things that shepherds are supposed to do is to gather God's people into a flock so they can receive care, so they can be protected, so they can be provided, and so they can be guided. Now, that is what God's purpose is, one of his purposes and one of the benefits of coming together in community that we can be protected, provided, and guided, and cared for. Now, we've seen that already, so that's kind of repetitive of some of the things that I've said over the last few weeks. But this prophecy doesn't stop there. You see, this scripture, this chapter is broken up in three sections. If you're a Bible studier, you may want to write this down. In verses 1 through 16, God speaks to the shepherds. He speaks to the leaders. He says, you ought to be caring for the sheep. That's what I want for my sheep. In verses 17 through 24, which we're about to look at, God addresses the flock. And we are going to get a really, really accurate picture of what life in a flock really looked like and how it relates to life in a church. That's verses 17 through 24. Excuse me. In verses 25 through 31, 32, God speaks of the covenant blessing of community, of what happens when God's people experience the first two sections of this chapter, what God's aim and what his goal is for community. And so we're back on point two. The first one is God wants to care for his people, and he raises up leaders to create an environment where God's people are cared for. The second thing he looks at is he speaks to the flock, and the second thing that we get the benefit of in community is this, is we get help with something called conflict resolution. Uh Uh-oh. Somebody said, "Uh uh-oh. You know... It's easy to be a wonderful Christian by yourself. Well, I say that, but that's not always true. We've all heard the little joke that says this guy was stranded on a deserted island. And he was rescued after like 10 years. And when the boat pulled up, there was three huts on the island. Anybody heard this joke before? The first hut, the guy asked him, he says, well, what's that? He said, that's where I live. He said, what's the second hut? He says, that's, that's where I go to church. He said, what's the third hut? He said, that's where I used to go to church. (laughs) Some are just getting that. Just waking up. Folks, here's the truth. We have an image of biblical community that's not real. When we talk about community, people start singing, Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya, no one argues here, Lord, no one does. Everybody gets along, my Lord. Kumbaya, that ain't real. (laughs) Folks, when we look at these scriptures, you're going to find out what life in a flock is like and why we need pastoral care. John Maxwell says that 20% of the average pastor's time is spent on conflict resolution. And many things that I read kind of try to get us to figure out a way that we can remove the conflict from the congregation so that we can be who God meant us to be. And I would say to this, they're wrong. You're never going to remove all conflict. Where people come together, where a flock comes together, there are going to be issues. I'm not trying to create a community here, a church, that's conflict-free. I'm trying to do something different as a leader. I'm trying to empower you to resolve conflict. You're going to have have conflict if people show up in your life. You get married. Anybody recently married under two years? Raise your hand. We'll pray for you. <laughs> Is the honeymoon over yet? Have you realized, ladies, that they leave the seat up? They squish the toothpaste from the top. That's what men do. They squeeze it from the top. They put the toilet paper in backwards. Everybody knows it flows out. It's in the Bible. My gosh, there's nothing worse than sitting there and you can't get the paper. It'll ruin a marriage. So I sat down before Patty and I got married. I did a prenup. 
toilet paper this way, <laughs> toothpaste this way. No, we didn't do a prenup. But I've trained her over the years. <laughs> and don't buy that cheap toilet paper. <laughs> buy the good stuff. Look, if we, if we work this hard but can't afford the good stuff, we just ought to go get another job. relationship. See, we've got this myth out there that, that is believed in the Christian community that if we get into a healthy church, everybody's going to get along. We're never going to have any friction. Everybody's perfect. And I'm telling you folks, if you find that church, don't go there. <laughs> You're going to mess it up. <laughs> Crafting Crown sings a song, Plastic Steeples and Plastic People. And I'm here to tell you, we don't need any more churches with plastic steeples or plastic people. When I look out at our country, let me tell you what we've lost. We've lost the ability as a nation to be civil. We've lost the ability to resolve conflict. We've lost the ability to disagree and not be disagreeable. And unless we, the church, learn how to do conflict resolution, unless we learn how to be peacemakers, no one in our nation is going to be able to play the role of peacemaker to make America great again. Look, whether you voted for the current president or not, I'm here to tell you, without the church, America will not be great again. They need, it needs the church. The problem is the church has forgot who it is. I'm studying for my doctorate. I've... I'm in my sixth class of seven classes, and I have to write a thesis. I've read about 100 books. I have to write tons of papers. And one of the things that's bothering me is with all these books I've had to read, I can't get over the amount of reading I have to do on subjects that pertain to the church that don't have anything to do with the Bible. I was sharing with my wife the other day. It, it disturbs me. I know why the church is all messed up. Because we're not believing this and living this. This has the answers, but we got man's wisdom for problems that man can't solve. And we've got to get back to understanding who we are. We're letting the culture define who we are. We're letting the culture lead us. The world's trying to tell the church who they ought to be and how they ought to function in the world. I ain't listening to them. Who are we? We are the flock of God. God is our shepherd. He establishes, we'll see next week, he establishes leadership and some other things in the church for our good. But God has a mission and a purpose for us in the earth. And to accomplish that mission, he has to bring us to a place of unity and community. And unity is not the absence of friction. So God speaks a word to Ezekiel about the leadership because they failed to do their job. Then he talks to the flock, and because the leaders didn't do their job, conflict resolution did not take place. And listen to what he says. He says, as for you, oh, my flock. Now, folks, whenever, oh, my, oh, as for you, that's not good. It's kind of like when I discipline one of my sons. Son, you need to go to your room. I'm going to, you know, you're going to be punished for three years. You're not going to come out of that room. You're not going to get but one meal a week, bread and water. So get in there. And as for you, buddy. You know, because when kids are watching the other one be disciplined, they're kind of excited about that. <laughs> as for you. This is an as for you moment. Yes, the leadership in Ezekiel's day had failed. But now God points to the flock, says, Oh, my flock, thus says the Lord. Behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Now, what this text does here is it really biblically points out what every shepherd knows. That in every flock, in every group, whether it's a gaggle of geese, is it a gaggle of geese, a flock of sheep, any group, a herd of cows, anything, human beings, there's a pecking order. And there is a pecking order in the flock. And there's going to be Heads button. And there's going to be things that have to be resolved. There's going to, we're going to have to learn conflict resolution skills. When I bring couples in when they're getting ready to get married, 
I go through several things, and one of the things that I do is I take them through a conflict resolution model because if they learn to resolve conflict consistently, it doesn't matter the problems they have in their marriage, they'll solve them. But one of the biggest challenges when people come in for marriage counseling is they don't know how to resolve conflict, and it's an American problem. Americans are avoiders. We won't tell people what they think, and then we'll go out and we'll badmouth them. We're avoiders. But now what's happening is because we don't resolve conflict as a nation, as a people, now we're beginning to attack each other and people are beginning to get violent. And folks, this is what we have to change. And the way we change is we've got to get honest about who we are and we're going to learn conflict resolution in community. See, one of the things that people think that when people leave the church, I get upset because I just worry about numbers. No, I'm telling you why I worry when people leave from church to church is they'll go from this church, they'll have a problem in this church, they'll take that problem to the next church, they won't resolve it there, they'll bring that problem, create problems, and they'll go leave and go to another one, and they never resolve it. It's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to begin to deal with the realities that it's hard to get along. My my wife and I have been married for 29 years. That didn't just happen. It happened because I'm a saint. No, she's the saint. Trust me. The majority of the conflict in our marriage has come from me. And the things I've learned to teach other people have come from having to deal with me. But he deals with the dynamic that sheep without a shepherd will not get along. Watch what happens. He says, is it too little for you that you've eaten up the pasture? That you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures? And that you've drunk of the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet. Now what Ezekiel, what God is prophesying is the shepherd's metaphor. God understood, Ezekiel understood that if you take a group of sheep and there's no shepherd leadership, what the sheep will do is they'll get a clear, clear, crystal clear drink of water and then they'll foul up that water for the next sheep. They won't worry about the next sheep behind them. Sheep are self-absorbed. God understood this. Ezekiel understood this, and now he's saying to the flock, hey, flock, I'm going to judge you because of your sheep dynamic. You see, in a flock, what happens is, is the rams, which are the males, and the bucks, they will dominate the females. They'll push them around. And the, the goats will dominate the sheep. And the ewes, which are the ladies that have the babies, they'll dominate the weaker ewes, and they'll dominate the little baby sheep. And there's this thing where they'll push each other around. Conflict is everywhere in a flock. Now, the key to a healthy flock is that the shepherd has to come in and has to lead that flock and resolve conflict. I said last week, I said sheep cannot ruminate if there's friction amongst other sheep and they can't eat and they can't grow. And one of the things a shepherd has to do in a flock, in a church, is he has to provide conflict resolution. He has to lead the people and teach the people how to get along. You know, we tell people to be in relationship. You need a, you need a community. You, you, you need a small group. People today don't know how to have relationship. And that's what we're going to teach you. Is Folks, I'm not, authentic biblical community is not a conflict-free zone. And if we get that idea that community is just a place where everybody gets along, I'm never going to have my feelings hurt, you're going to be in and out of churches, you're going to be disillusioned with the church, and what God has for you will never become a reality. People are a pain in the neck, and sometimes a little bit lower. But when we begin to believe, and I believe this to the core of my being, that we cannot get where God wants to take us without each other. When we begin to believe that, there's going to be an awakening. There needs to be an awakening. You see, Moses was called to take three million Jews to the promised land. The man could have got there in 11 days. But it took him 40 years. Does anybody want to know why? He had to take three million people with him. He was a shepherd. He shepherded God's people through the wilderness. He shepherded them through the desert, providing and protecting and caring for them and guiding them, making them into a people so that God could bring them into the promised land. This theme is repeated over and over and over and over again, even in the life of Jesus. When Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, Jesus wants to bring us into a flock. 
Jesus wants to teach us how to live within community, to get along as brothers and sisters. Folks, I'm one of seven. I know what family's about. I had five sisters, two bathrooms. I know conflict. Are you done yet? No. It's been three days. Can I get into the bathroom? I love my siblings, but man, we fought. There's no one could beat the snot out of me like my brother. My brother and I would get in a fight. We'd go to school. Somebody would pick on my brother. I'm ready to defend him. That's family. We just got in a fight. My brother knocked my front teeth out. My brother jabbed me with a pencil in the back of my head. My brother calls me seven stitches in the front of my head. And those are the public things I can tell you. <laughs> but don't mess with my brother. That's what God wants to do in us. There needs to be a reformation in the church in America. You don't want to miss my July 4th message, 1st of July. You don't want to miss it. I can't wait to preach it two weeks from now. Next week, we'll finish. Next week's pretty good, too. But I'm jacked up about the fourth. See, God, I believe, is doing something in our nation. We don't even perceive it. He's reforming the church. We need a reformation. We need an awakening, folks, or it's not going to get done. The way we're doing church, the way we've done church, will not meet the needs of what we're facing. And what we need is authentic biblical community where people can learn to be biblical. And you have to be biblical first because when you're authentic before you're biblical, we're jerks. We need to be biblical so that we can be authentic. And we need to be authentic so that we can be community. And what is needed today is a people who can model for our community how to get along, how to resolve differences, how to not be a flock that's divided, but a flock that learns how to care for one another. I am convinced that the key to evangelism is to learn how to love one another. Every time you see, read the New Testament, there's 50 one another's in there. We need to reach each other before we can reach across the street. And then we need to reach across the street and we need to reach the world. But it starts with a community being brought together, learning to cut through the illusions of community and learning to get into community. This is what he says. As for my flock, they eat what you've trampled with your feet and drink what you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean because you have pushed with the side and the shoulder, butted the weak. With your horns and scatter them abroad, therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey. In other words, God's saying, I'm going to shepherd you. I'm going to teach you not how to push each other around. I'm going to teach you how to love one another. Now, I got a quote here, because I've not been following my notes, but I got a quote here that I want to read and I want to get it correct. So I'm going to look through my notes. Because it comes from a man who gave his life for what I'm telling you. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a martyr in the Second World War. And he gave his life for what I'm about to read to you. He says this, A great disillusionment with others, with Christians in general, and if we are fortunate with ourselves, is bound to overwhelm us as surely as God desires to lead us to an understanding of genuine Christian community. Now understand, he's in the Second World War. He's in prison. Here's a man that went to prison and died a martyr for the things that he believed. And he's talking about Christian community where the Christians botched it in the Second World War. The sooner this moment of disillusionment comes over the individual and the community, the better for both. Did you hear that? The sooner, he said, a great disillusionment with others, with Christians in general, and if we are fortunate with ourselves, is bound to overwhelm us as surely as God desires to lead us to an understanding of genuine Christian community, authentic biblical community. That's what I mean by it, genuine Christian community. The sooner this moment of disillusionment comes over the individual and the community, the better for both. As the sooner we get rid of the illusion that it's going to be kumbaya and we're never going to have any conflict, everybody's going to say the right thing. Folks, I can't, take, I can't speak for 45 minutes without putting my foot in my mouth. I've tried. I don't even care anymore. I just repent. 
I can't say things perfect. Last night I did this sermon. I did use an illustration. It totally panned. It just totally botched it. So I blamed it on my wife and moved on. <laughs> no, I didn't do that because I've learned. Partly. Folks, we stick our foot in our mouths. Sometimes we're insensitive. Sometimes the preacher doesn't get it right. We've got to get over this illusion that Christian community means that everything is going to be wonderful and kumbaya. I'm here to tell you community is worth it because you're going to get care. Community is worth it because you're going to learn how to do conflict resolution, which if you can learn to do conflict resolution, it'll affect your marriages, it'll affect your employment, it'll affect your fr friendship, it'll affect how you work out in the community. We need to learn how to do conflict resolution. Three of you, praise God. But listen to what he says. This is the biggest party, what he says. He says, as soon as, the better you see the disillusion, you get past it, the better. He says, those who love their dream of a Christian community more than the Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. Folks, Ezekiel 34 is a roadmap to what God wants to do in every flock. First, in every church across the world, God wants his people to receive care. And if they receive pastoral care and they receive pastoral leadership, which is not what people think, pastoral leadership is not kissing everybody's butt and doing everything everybody wants. It's caring for people in need. It's providing leadership. It's creating an environment like the things I've talked about in the last few weeks. If that takes place and you get pastoral care, then conflict resolution begins to become a reality. People slowly begin to learn what the pastors are teaching them and, and what God's all about. And people begin to get along with people that they don't get along with. We begin to put aside our differences. We begin to put aside our agendas. We realize that, you know what, I have a perspective, they have a perspective. And as long as it's under God's perspective, everybody's okay. And people begin to become into unity and community begins to form because there's a third place. This is the ultimate goal. God wants to bring his people to a place called the covenant covenant of peace. Look at verse 25. Now, if you read verses 21, 22, 23, and 24, he talks about raising up David the shepherd. That's Jesus the Messiah. I don't have time to get into it. That's prophetic. That's eschatological. That's what Jesus did. That's the good shepherd. But what I want to end with this morning is verse 25. And I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land, and they will dwell safely in the wilderness. This is the shepherd's metaphor. What does he mean? And sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And the fruit trees shall yield their increase. And they shall be safe in their land. And they shall know that I am the Lord. When I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. And they shall no longer be prey of the nations. Nor shall beasts of the land devour them. This is shepherd metaphor stuff. But they shall dwell safely, and no one shall make them afraid. I will raise them up for them a garden of renown, and they shall a garden to eat from a garden, and they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor shall they bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. Thus shall they know that I am the Lord their God, and with them, and they, the house of Israel, and my people, says the Lord. Here's what he means. When we come into the care of our loving shepherd, and we begin to come into a community where we begin to be taught and, and expected and empowered to begin to resolve our differences and to begin to know how to do unity in reality versus some kind of conformity. We begin to enter a season called the covenant of peace, where what happens is as the community comes together, that greater anointing, that greater possibility, that greater destiny begins to become a reality. And then what happens is the things that you've struggled with before, the things that you've tried to do but failed before, now begin to become a reality. There's a covenant of peace with the land. This is a shepherd's metaphor. Basically what God's saying is where you failed at everything before, where things were tough and worked against you before, now you're going to come into a season where the wind's going to be behind your back and the trees are going to yield their fruit. And when you need rain, you're going to get rain. And there's not going to be predators to eat you up. They're not going to be there to take away the things that have been taken away. And folks, that is in the context of community. Every one of these promises, which I could spend the next hour going over, freedom from enslavement, fruitfulness, Blessing, showers, peace, 
Every one of them are in the plural. He's saying to the community, when the community begins to respond to the shepherding of Jesus Christ through the under-shepherds, and they begin to take on the abilities that they're being taught by God, they're growing up and learning to resolve conflict, they come into a season where God brings them into peace to where they can prosper and fulfill their destiny. And I submit to you this morning, that's where God is taking us. He is taking us as a people to the covenant of peace, where he can bless us individually and he can bless us collectively. And we can become a blessing to our community. Folks, we're part of a bigger plan God's plan to do a work in our nation. I'm going to share this on July, in July 4th. We're part of a movement of what God is doing. The, America has one hope, and that hope is us. Us figuring out who we are. Stop going to the world for your identity. And begin to ask God what he says about us in this book, and begin to believe it. I become convinced as I wind this up that we need a back to the Bible movement where we just begin to believe our book again. Who cares what Oprah has to say about it? I like Oprah. I'm not picking on Oprah. Pick anybody else. I don't even watch these shows. I don't know who you are. The five. Who else is there? What is the women that meet in the morning? Uh, the view. Who cares what they think? We have to start caring what God thinks. Yes. We have to start believing who we are based on what he says. Yes. And I'm here to tell you he's our shepherd. We're his sheep. We're individual sheep, but we're a flock. Our destinies are wrapped up together. Here's my take home for you. I challenge you to write down and pray till you believe this, that our destinies are entwined. What God has for me is dependent upon you. And what God has for you is dependent upon that other person in the pew. And as we begin to believe that, because I don't think we do, I think we're very individualistic as Americans. They were in one mind, in one accord on the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit was poured out. Folks, we don't need large numbers. We need a large heart for God. And a large heart for one another. And when God chooses to come down in the covenant of peace... You're going to see things you've never believed would ever happen. Because that's what God does. The hardest part is to get people to live together. Begin to believe. If you don't agree with me, send me emails why you don't agree with this. We'll talk it out. We need each other. We are stronger together than we are individually. I'll leave you one quote. One of my favorite movies, The Gladiator. The reason I love that movie is they interviewed me to do the part of Russell Crowe. <laughs> I turned it down because it was too violent. But there's one scene where he's going out into the Colosseum, and he turns to his men. He says, no matter what's behind these gates, we have a better chance, now I'm paraphrasing, of surviving if we stick together. Folks, I'm here to tell you, I don't know what the future holds, but I am going to promise you this, I believe this to the core of my being, that whatever the future holds will be greater if we stick together. There's nothing outside the gates that we can't conquer if we, don't, if we stick together. Because Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church and we can only be the church when we gather together in like faith and authenticity according to the scriptures 
together. Father, I'm laying it all on the line now. You want a community. You want a people. You love individuals, and you love them so much, you say, I have a place for you. There's a place for every one of us where the blessings of God are enlarged. And you're inviting us to be a part of a people. Lord, and yet we have individual needs, and so I pray for each individual here this morning that you would meet them where they are as individuals and show yourself strong. And Lord, confirm and affirm the things that I'm saying or disconfirm, whatever that word may be. Get them biblically where they need to be. And then, Lord, bring us together in unity, not conformity, but unity, to where we love God and learn how to love one another so that you can bring us into that place, that covenant of peace, where we can have fruitfulness and showers of blessing be re re uh, freed from our bondages and become a blessing to our community. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. The ushers are going to come and they're going to receive the morning offering. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your giving. Make sure you stop by and check out the Doing Good stations. God bless you.